1798, a very young 26-year-old revolutionary general called Napoleon Bonaparte set sail for Egypt and France. He had 400 ships, 35,000 men, and 1,000 pieces of artillery. His private dreams was to colonize the entire Mediterranean, to turn it into a French sea. Publicly, he announced to the Egyptians he was bringing them liberty, equality, and fraternity, and he was going to rid them forever of these cruel medieval rulers, a band of knights called the Mamluks. Along with the army invading Egypt, Napoleon had groups of French artists, scientists, and engineers to record the ancient land, and to keep an eye open for those ancient treasures for which Egypt was so famous. On their march to Cairo, Egyptology was born. I've just drawn the River Nile. Cairo is here. Now, as soon as the French, who had been marching all day and were pretty exhausted, saw Cairo and passed the pyramids, they set themselves into five great regimental squares. French firepower, bang, 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 bang. The Mamluks, who have been swanning around in their beautiful silk and cashmere uniforms, their huge guns, their great sabres, now got on their horses and charged the French. What happened, of course, was a slaughter, a massacre. 2,000 Mamluks were killed, 29 French died. They said the bodies of the Mamluks and their horses were piled around each one of these squares. Their silks and cashmeres were burning from the gun cotton from the muskets. It was a terrible and frightening sight. So the French entered the city that day, strutted about in the streets. But there was another exchange, too, a rather gentler and more profound one, perhaps. When the French came to Cairo, there were shops selling coffee, or cafe as it was then called. But they were selling it not by packets in shops, but the shops had little stalls in the street, and they were making the coffee and bringing it out onto the pavements, and people would sit and talk and drink their coffee. And on that day, the boulevard was born. Within a few weeks, the first institute of archaeology in Egypt came into being. Napoleon's officers took over the houses of the Mamluks, the defeated soldiers who ran south into Egypt. These beautiful dwelling houses were now lived in by the French. These were the people who were going to set the government up for Egypt. They were divided into four separate divisions in a grand French academy. There was the political economists, generals, senior scholars from France who were going to run the country. Then there were three other divisions that were looking at everything else in Egypt. There were physicists, inventors, botanists, zoologists, surgeons. There were artists, poets, writers, musicians. And it was these people, the surveys that they did here, there was really the beginning of Egyptology. It was a contact between the new revolutionary France of the West and the oldest civilization that they knew on Earth. <laughs> After the Battle of the Pyramids, the French army split in half. Napoleon struck north into Syria and sent General Desai marching south into Upper Egypt pursuing Mamluks. It was very hard work chasing what was left of the Mamluk army into Upper Egypt. And everywhere they went, the French soldiers had to put down endless rebellions. And they were short of everything, from bread to bullets. It was really a terrifyingly hard march. But suddenly, when these ragged and diseased regiments of men, very low morale and very short on temper, came to Thebes and saw the temples, so one diarist remarks, they stood with one accord and looked in amazement, and then clapped their hands with delight. It was as if, at that moment, 
they had conquered Egypt, they said. You know, at that moment too, Europe knew hardly anything of these remains. Just a few travellers had been here, not much. The French were going to change all that. A year later, they wrote an inscription down there on the pylon, listing all the major temples of Upper Egypt and their latitude and longitude. And then the Academy of Sciences and Arts went out and started to measure and draw these monuments for the first time and show them to the West. And the West has been fascinated with them ever since. Even Napoleon's generals, usually drunk on war and glory, were as fascinated with ancient Egypt as the scholars. Their records of the army marching into Upper Egypt, in reality a daily horror story, read like a journey to a magic world. A journey whose archaeological record was in the printed pages of the Description d'Egypte, those grand volumes that Napoleon's scholars published on their return to France, one of the greatest and certainly one of the largest publications in the world. Now, look, this isn't just a normal archaeological expedition. These are not guys in well-equipped suits flying in an aeroplane. These are people in rags, with ophthalmia, with pus in their eyes. They're making their pencils by beating out bullets, but they're making such wonderful drawings. Of all Egyptian monuments, the French's favourite was the mortuary temple of King Ramesses II, called the Ramesseum. Its yellowed walls seem like a living painting by Claude or Poussin. This vast colossus was mostly buried in those days, 60 feet high and weighing 100 tonnes. It had been toppled and broken in an ancient earthquake. The French archaeologists excavated and drew the statue, and the expedition sculpture, Castex, carved all their names upon the top of Pharaoh's head. The statue quickly became a European legend, especially after Percy Shelley used its image in a poem. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Shelley had actually based his wonderful poem on a less fortunate effort by one Horace Smith, a city stockbroker, who'd penned a volume with the most unfortunate title of Rejected Addresses. The first line goes something like this. In Egypt's sandy silence all alone stands a gigantic leg. At this point, you may have gathered that the beautiful Ramesseum temple had become a part of a very British dream. After sinking the French fleet in a daring sea battle, Nelson's navy had completely isolated the French in Egypt. Slowly, over a period of three years, both the soldiers and the scholars trickled back to France. In Egypt, they were followed by a British expeditionary force and a host of collectors ready to strip the antique land. Now the greatest of these collectors is the man who wrote his name up there, Belzoni, Giovanni Battista Belzoni. He was an engineer from Padua, a great giant of a man, a friendly person, a person of great character, and he stamped his name on really this early period of Egyptian archaeology.
Belzoni actually set his house up in here, along with his wife, Sarah, and their servant, as an Irish guy, long-suffering lad called James. He'd been sent down here to look for a statue which had sort of been given, conveniently, to the British nation. Belzoni had come to collect it and take it back to England. So he came down here with his wife, and they looked around, and he found it under a heap of sand, and as he says in his bestseller, smiling gently at the thought of coming to England. Belzoni made a wooden frame to hold the smiling statue. Then he and his men engaged in a month-long purgatory of pushing and pulling to get it to the riverside. To London's great delight, 17 months later, the Royal Engineers installed young Memnon in the British Museum. It was the start of a long career of excavation and treasure seeking for Belzoni. Amongst hordes of other treasure seekers, mostly agents of European consuls. His name stands out as the first famous archeologist of ancient Egypt. Well bitten by the antiquities bug, Belzoni and the British consul decided to continue their hunt for treasure and antiquity in the hills behind the Ramesseum, in the Valley of the Kings. Belzoni describes walking through this same valley in August, 1817. Hasn't changed much. He later wrote, I happened to be carrying a stick with me at the time, and on thrusting it into a hole in a rock, I found one to be very deep. he'd found his first royal tomb, and others quickly followed, some of them with fine sarcophagi, and all of them unknown. This was his first really beautiful monument that he found here. It's the tomb of a late Ramesside prince, a warrior prince, called Montu Herkofeshev. Belzoni was absolutely entranced by this tomb. He said it gave a clever and